Let me tell you an amazing story about a person that you want to be like. John Harper was born into a Christian home in Glasgow, Scotland in 1872. When he was about 14 years old, he became a Christian himself. And from that time on, he began to tell others about Christ. Now, I mean, just that in itself is, is a wonderful message. At 17 years of age, he began to preach, going up and down the streets of Scotland there in his hometown in the village, pouring out his passionate pleading for men to come to know Christ, to be reconciled to God. After five or six years spending his time preaching on the street corners, he worked in the mill during the day. But he was taken in by Reverend E.A. Carter of the Baptist Pioneer Mission in London. This set Harper free to devote his whole time and energy to the work that was so near and dear to his heart, evangelism. Soon, in September of 1896, he started his own church. It began with 25 members, and it numbered over 500 by 13 years later. So he was extremely successful as a pastor. During this time, he had been married and widowed. Before he lost his wife, though, God had blessed Harper with a beautiful little girl named Nana. Harper's life was quite an eventful one. He almost drowned several times. When he was two and a half years of age, he fell into a pool, was pulled out, and was resuscitated by his mother. At the age of 26, he was swept out to sea by a reverse current and barely survived. At the age of 32, he faced death on a leaking ship in the Mediterranean. Water and, and John are not getting along very well, it seems. If anything, though, these brushes with death just seemed to increase his zeal for sharing the good news, for telling people about Christ and what he had done for him. So evangelism became even more important in John Harper's life. While pastoring his church in London, Harper continued his fervent and faithful evangelism. In fact, he was such a, a faithful, zealous evangelist that the Moody Church in Chicago asked him to come over to America for a series of meetings. He did, and the meetings went extremely well. A few years later, Moody Church asked him to come back again and do a series of meetings. And so it was that Harper boarded a ship in Southampton, England, second-class ticket, headed for another voyage to America. Harper's wife had died just a few years before and he had with him his only child, Nana, age six. What happens after this we know mainly from two sources. One is Nana who died in 1986 at the age of 80. She remembered being woken up by her father one night, a couple of nights into their voyage. He told her that the ship had struck an iceberg. He said that there was another ship that was close by that was going to come to rescue them, but as a precaution, he put her into a lifeboat with an older cousin who was also on this trip. Her father, Harper, said that he would wait for the other ship to arrive. Of course, the rest of the story is a tragedy that is well known. Little Nana and her cousin were saved, but the ship they were on was the Titanic. The only way we know what happened after that what happened to John Harper is because in a prayer meeting in Hamilton, Ontario, some months later, a young Scotsman stood up in tears and told the extraordinary story of how he was converted. He explained that he had been on the Titanic the night that it struck the iceberg. He clung to a piece of floating debris in the fridge of water. The, the waves are swinging, moving people around. And here comes a man also clinging to a piece of debris, John Harper. And John Harper gets close to him. Harper called out, Man, are you saved? No, I am not, I replied. He shouted back, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The waves bore Harper away again, but a little later he was washed back beside me again. Are you saved now? He called out. No, I answered. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And then... Losing his hold on the wood, Harper sank. And there, alone in the night, with two miles of water under me, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I am John Harper's last convert. In the category of evangelists, if we wanted to use a sports analogy, John Harper would be an all-star. I mean, this guy did it and did it so well. On the other hand, 
in the sports analogy, I would be one of the, the lowest subs sitting on the far end of the bench because I've not been as successful as John Harper. Maybe I've not had the same zeal that John Harper has. I would be a rather lackluster substitute for John Harper. What leads people and some churches to be ahead of the pack when it comes to leading people to that saving knowledge of Christ, to bringing them into the fold of those who will live in eternity in heaven? Why are some ahead and others trail? I would have to say if I were choosing a single one-word answer, it would be priorities. Our priorities, I think, easily get muddled, get muddied. Had a great opportunity to, to meet with Chris, have breakfast this week. And just hearing some of his story and what God has done in his life. How on his walk, he said, and I love his phrase, he said, God always had these lampposts, different people who were there reminded me of what I needed to do. Well, sometimes I think that, that we as a church, churches across the world, we need lampposts, we need reminders about what it is that we are to do. Sometimes as a church, we forget. So many programs, so many things that we can do, so many things that are good for us. And it's not bad to do those. A trip to Miss Patty's, that's a good thing. It helps us build relationships, deepen fellowship. Those are good things to do. But if those are the only things that we do, we're missing out on what God has called us to do as his disciples. This morning I'd like for us to take just a few minutes and explore this role of evangelism in our life, in the life of us as a church. Please turn me in your Bibles to Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20. I'm actually going to start in verse 18 this morning. That's that you stand as we honor the reading of God's word. Matthew 28. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let us pray. Lord, this morning we do know that you are with us. To the end of our time here on earth, to the end of the age, as you have promised. Sometimes, though, I think that we neglect that you are there with us and we neglect the task that you have given us. So, Lord, we just pray that your words this morning, your words, not mine, but your words would prick our spirit, would stir our hearts, and then stir our feet and hands to action to be like John Harper. People who are willing to use our last breath to lead others to you. Lord, just, just let us hear with an open mind this morning. Tear down all of our defenses, remove all the barriers, take away all the distractions that might be running through our minds, and let us focus on this, the most important commission that you have given mankind, those who believe you. We love you. We thank you for this time that we share with you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Our title this morning is Tell the Good News. When it comes to good news or bad news, which is it that people seem most inclined to tell other people about? Bad news. Bad news. Now, why do you think that mankind is preferable to telling bad news rather than the good news? Attention. Attention, okay. It would get attention from me. What else might be the reason that we would want to tell the bad news rather than the good news? Makes us feel better. Yeah. Uh, Something bad happened to someone else. So we're still doing good or whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when I hear someone else's bad story, I'm not having to deal with that, so I'm I'm doing okay comparatively. But why would that person want to tell me their, their bad news? Well, to tell you their bad news to get the pressure off of them if it's about them. Okay. It's help. Maybe sometimes they're looking for sympathy, right. looking for some advice, looking for some guidance. Sometimes, like I say, it just takes the pressure off just to tell someone about this, this stuff that's going on. Because often you feel like you're carrying this, this huge burden by yourself. So we will, we will tell other people the bad news more so often than we will the good news. But let's suppose that you won the lottery. 
W would you tell anyone that you won the lottery? Su Susan's going, very few. You, you would tell me as you gave me your tithe check, right? <laughs> I'd tell you. <laughs> why, why wouldn't we tell people the good news that you won the lottery? They'd want it. They'd want it. <laughs> people you never knew were relatives suddenly show up and they, they want to share of this. I mean, you could buy me a new car, a new house. And what? Say, listen what I need. Listen what I need. Yeah, I got this bad news I got to tell you about. And you can help me have it in good news. Well, do you tell people when, like, maybe when you decided to get married, did you tell people about that? Yeah. Was that good news or bad news? <laughs> Face. <laughs> you stuck your hand up in everyone's face. Look at this. Yeah. Okay. How about when your your children, when you knew you were pregnant or grandchildren on the way, did you tell anyone about that? Everybody. Everyone. Everybody. That's right. <laughs> Total strangers. I did. Yeah. When <laughs> the day Braden was born, Lynn's in the San Antonio airport with a laptop and she's going around total strangers want to see pictures of my grandbaby <laughs> right. what are they going to say no <laughs> they knew that look of determination they were going to see pictures of the grandbaby so we, we will tell good news sometimes but not always but you know we, we could have a really good day you could have had eight hours sleep you've had a wonderful conversation with a friend it's a weekend does it ever seem like sometimes just one harsh word from someone or one event in your mind makes it a bad day it ruins your weekend research by Shelley Gable and Jonathan Haidt indicates that we have three times more positive experiences than we do negative three times more positive than we do negative but what do most people talk about the negatives our mind has this innate tendency to give more weight to the negative things that go on in our world than in than to the positive things well, we can change that. We have to focus on how do I change that. And if I'm always focusing on negative, then I'm going to notice a lot of negativity in my life or negativity around me. Great literary figures know that this is something that we have to change. A recent study by Nathaniel Lambert and his colleagues at Brigham University showed that for people, when they experience and share their positive experiences in life, it leads to them having heightened well-being, increased overall life satisfaction, and even more energy. When I talk about the things that are good in my life, the positive things, it makes me feel better about my life, I have more energy, increased overall life satisfaction. Then why wouldn't we talk about that? Charlotte Bronte, the author, wrote, Happiness quite unshared can scarcely be called happiness. It has no taste. In the Common Reader, the writer Virginia Woolf writes, Pleasure has no relish unless we share it. We want to share. We need to share those good things. And the research proves this point. In other words, telling the good news, it's good for us. It's good for our life. Where we picked up in Matthew 28, Jesus has been crucified, he's been buried, he has risen from the tomb. He's meeting with 11 disciples. They've come to the mountain in Galilee as they had been directed. The verses that we're studying this morning are the last words that Matthew puts into his gospel. You see that this mirrors Acts 1, where a commission very similar is given, some different words, but it's a very similar commission that's given. But in Acts, it's also described about Jesus' ascension into heaven. Matthew intentionally left off the ascension. Why? Do you think the ascension, seeing Jesus go up, would take away from the message, the great commissions we call it, to go and make disciples? Matthew knew the principle, the writing principle, that last words are lasting words. So what are the last words he wants us to take away from his gospel? Go and make disciples of all nations. Don't talk about the ascension. God will take care of letting that word out later, and Dr. Luke covered that in Acts. But right now Matthew says I'm stopping there this is where God's telling me to quit writing go and make disciples of all nations as we read through these verses there's a powerful constancy verse 18 and Jesus came near and said to them all authority has been given to me verse 18 verse 19 go therefore and make disciples of all nations 
And some translations in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. All, all, all. Not just a little, not just some. Jesus has the power from the Father. We, we know that. He's saying, I have authority. And now I'm going to share that. I'm going to delegate that to you because I'm going back to heaven. Now, I'm sure the disciples still didn't quite understand everything. I mean, what has gone on? They've seen Jesus crucified. They've seen him buried. And now here he stands before them. And they're still trying to figure out some of the message he gave them weeks or months or years before. Because they didn't always quite get it. But now he's saying, here's something else for you to do. My last command to you. Wow. They're still trying to wrap their head around all this that's going on. And he's giving them this big task. How do we like big jobs? We prefer smaller ones, don't we? Something I can get done, mark it off my to-do list, move on. We prefer those. But he's saying, go and make disciples. How many people do you think that those 11 apostles could themselves lead to salvation? Yeah, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands, but he knows, and they know, they have a limited life. You and I, we have a limited lifespan. So when I go and make disciples, as Jesus made disciples, now he's multiplying himself. They will multiply themselves. And you and I, we are disciples. We are to multiply ourselves. The church body, it's not the job of the pastor. It's part of the pastor's job, but your job is the same as mine in this respect. You are to make disciples. Now, a lot of people say, no, no, no. <laughs> I didn't get that memo, Brother Van. That's not my job. Yes, it is. This scripture doesn't say pastors go. He's talking to his disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations. The word that's used there for all nations, ethnos, that means people groups. It's not talking about just a particular country. It's talking about people groups. So when we say all nations, how many people groups do we have in Nashville? I think we're somewhere around 60, 80, maybe over 100 now. So when we say go to all nations, I don't have to go to Egypt. I don't have to go to Syria. I don't have to go to New Zealand. Doesn't mean that some shouldn't. But we can reach people groups right here. The, the people who bless us, when they come here and they, they're serving, they open up for us, they close up after us, they help us off in setting up. When that happens, we have some people who are from different people groups. AJ's been working with us. His mother, Amy, is, if I remember, she's from Egypt, right? I believe she's from Egypt. We had Kasim, and he's from the Middle East. We had some folks that we've built a good relationship with, different people groups. And it's been a delight to see them all come in and sit at the table or pull up a chair over here and listen to gospel. Now, do we always have the chance to lead them to conversion? Maybe not. Maybe we're just planting that seed. And we have to be very careful. We, we can look at people and we could say, they're from the Middle East. Well, I don't like them because they're Middle Easterners. And they bomb the, the Twin Towers. And, and we're going to see how that is a wrong mindset for us. Well, Christ says, hey, they're people. They sinned. And I want them to know me so I can forgive their sin. That is our tasking. When we look at this, go, therefore, and make disciples. That, that word go, how do we take that? How do we translate that? How do we use that in our life? One commentator noted that sometimes too much is made of the word go, and sometimes too little is made of the word go. Too much in that some people have used that for years to say, we've got to have these missionaries to go abroad. And the emphasis is on the word go. Others just sort of subordinate it to the make disciples. That Well, anybody can just make disciples wherever they are. And there's no emphasis on some people need to go. It needs to be a part of it. Now, Buddy may not ever be called to overseas missionary like Mark and Pam were. And that's okay. That doesn't mean at some point in time, God may not put it on Buddy's heart to go on a short-term mission trip. And, and that's, that's a good thing to do. It, it helps us understand what the, the, those who are out there full-time are doing. But it doesn't say that we can't be missionaries right here, reaching the nations. If we went right now, if we all got in our cars, went up here to Murfreesboro Road, took a left, and took an immediate left, there's a trailer park there. And my understanding is that the majority of people living there are Hispanic. 
I'm just trying to figure out, okay, how, what are we going to do? How are we going to reach that group? Because there's people, a lot of people. How can we reach them? How can we love on them? How can we help them understand salvation is available to them at no cost? So we, we don't have to go far to serve, to reach out. What stops us from duplicating ourselves? What stops us from making disciples? I think for some, it's a fear of rejection. You ever thought about that? I meet someone and I start telling them what God has done in my life and they say, oh no, I don't want to hear that. Just, just stop right there. I heard all that stuff before. I don't want to hear any more. Or is that the fear that we have? So we maybe are hesitant then to share our salvation. How God has changed our life dramatically, in many cases, dramatically changed our life. But that rejection, we don't deal well with rejection, do we? We want to be embraced and accepted, and we want people to hear our message. So when I know you're a Christian, then I'll tell you my story. But you, I've just met, and I don't know you, so I better not yet. I better wait and see. Does he not need to know? It may be that he is a Christian, but he maybe has not been welcomed to the Lord lately. And when he hears my story, then it helps refresh his faith, reignites his passion. But if I don't share it with him, he misses out on that opportunity. Maybe he doesn't know God at all. And God's given me that opportunity, that one chance, as he is clinging to the driftwood, just like I am, to tell him. This young Scotsman said he had two miles of water beneath him. And at that moment, he chose to accept Christ as his Savior. John Harper, quite the all-star. But rejection might keep us from it. Adrian Rogers, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, a former uh, pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, he's gone to heaven now, was feeling a bit discouraged because people were not responding at the invitation time. He was not having people come forward and make a profession of faith. He felt so distraught, he asked God, says, God, just show me a verse to help me with this situation. He opened his Bible, and he fell to 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, which reads, They are not rejecting you, but me. What, what a freeing statement. All we are asked to do is to share, and if they choose not to reject it, just like Adrian Rogers found, they're not rejecting me, they're rejecting God and his invitation from his word. So all I have to do is be obedient and share my faith. Certainly, the fear of rejection may paralyze some people when it comes to evangelizing. But I think the biggest problem that we see in worldwide churches is misplaced priorities. During the time of the Iranian hostage crisis, 1979 through 1981, Greg Livingstone was asked to give a Missions Minute presentation in a large evangelical church on the East Coast. One minute. What can you share in one minute about missions? Greg thought about it. He decided he was going to use two questions. First was, how many of you are praying for the 52 American hostages being held in Iran? 4,000 hands go up. He says, great, wonderful. Put your hands down, please. Now, how many of you are praying for the 42 million Iranians being held hostage by Islam? Four hands go up. Greg Livingstone said, what are you guys? Americans first and Christians second? I thought this was a Bible-believing church. Talk about a rebuke. Talk about condemnation. And talk about reaching people. You see, our priorities can get off track. I could say, someone who's from Middle East, <laughs> not worried about them, hope they burn in hell. We could say that. And there are people who believe that wholeheartedly. Instead of saying, they're being held hostage by Islam. And just maybe I can share Christ with them and free them. It's happening. It is happening today. In the faith equation, Dr. Marvin Bittiger, professor of mathematics <clears throat> excuse me, at Purdue University, claims that by 2033, every person on the planet capable of understanding the gospel will have been presented the gospel. Okay, 
How's that going to happen? We sang a song this morning, Tell the Good News. Did we really mean it? Did we mean those words? Here's another song that we sang very early in the service today. If you would please. We've heard the joyful sound. Jesus saved. Jesus saved. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saved. Jesus saved. Next. Bear the news to every land. Climb the mountains. Cross the ways. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saved. Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. By his death and his life. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Shout it brightly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves. Are we shouting it brightly? Are we going across the ways? Are we telling the good news? Or are we victims of misplaced priorities? You see, if we don't share the good news, then everyone won't by 2033 have heard the gospel. But for those who are involved, who are reaching out, who are trying to share the good news, it's working. Statistics show there are 34,000 converts daily in South America. 34,000. 28 to 37,000 Chinese converts daily. 23 to 25,000 African converts daily. Here's a great one. 16,000 Muslims come to Christ daily. In December 2001, Sheikh Ahmad al Qatani, a leading Saudi cleric, appeared in a live interview, Al Jazeera Satellite Television, confirmed that sure enough, Muslims are converting to Jesus in alarming numbers. He said, in every hour, 667 Muslims convert to Christianity. Every day, 16,000 Muslims convert to Christianity. Every year, 6 million Muslims convert to Christianity. Stunned, the interviewer interrupted the cleric and said, Hold on, let me clarify. Do we have 6 million converting from Islam to Christianity? al Qatani repeated his assertion every year, and he added, A tragedy has happened. 6 million? We can rejoice over six million a year. But how many could it be? But they don't have to be in the Middle East. We're having incredible numbers of prisoners in United States institutions who are converting to Islam. It's not a religion of love and peace. You hear that garbage floating around on television and radio. It's not a religion of love and peace. It's a religion of war. And we have people who are converting to that. Churches, churches and denominations can easily get too caught up in numbers. How many members you have, how many uh, new members did you have joined, how many baptisms did you have. We get caught up in those numbers. Jesus only had one number in mind. All. All nations. All nations. Nations using all the power that he has delegated to us. Teach them all the things that he taught us, his disciples. The credit and the glory, you know, you, you've heard it. I have too. Well, uh, led seven people to Christ last week. How many did you lead? Oh, you must have had an off week, didn't you? Well, but the seven's not my high week. That's just high week this month. Now, see, in the first week of April, I had, I had nine that, that, that week. How many did you have that first week of April? You, you know how people do? The credit, that we're, it's like, I did it. No, I'm simply the vessel. I am the mouthpiece. I am the, the way that God speaks to someone. But it's not me. It's not my message. It's certainly not my salvation that I'm sharing with them. I'm nothing more than the mouthpiece. The credit and the glory goes to God. Matthew 20, verses 24 through 28. When the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant. Now let me back up. What's happened? The mother, James and John, has gone to Jesus. She bows at his feet. She says, now when you're in your glory, when you're in heaven, would you put one of my boys on your right and one boy on your left? Let one sit at your right hand, one at your left hand. And Jesus is not happy with this. And now we pick up. When the, other turn, when the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with the two brothers. Hey, what's your mama doing? Tell your mama to be quiet, would you? 
But I mean, they're not happy with the two or with their mother. But Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles dominate them, and the men of high position exercise power over them. It must not be like that among you. High power, low power, he says, not like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Is the church, is our church truly willing to serve? Are we willing to be a slave to the great commission that was given? As a church, we have work to do. As a church, we have people to reach right here in the Priest Lake area, in Antioch, and in Nashville. As a church, we've been commissioned to make disciples. First comes evangelizing, then the continued, entre- continued teaching and training, the discipling process. We have to adopt a mindset of being persistent and consistent. You know, I know that churches for decades will have a revival once a year. Okay. What are we doing the rest of the year? The other 51 weeks, what are we doing to reach out? We can have excuses. Excuses are just that. Victor Borge, many of you remember Victor Borge, a comedian and great uh, performer, had a concert at the University of Vermont in Burlington. Had begun the concert when a woman who was noticeably late hurried down the center aisle and took her seat. Borge stopped the concert, walked to the edge of the stage and said, Why are you late? Well, she starts telling that she got caught up in traffic coming over from Shelburne, Vermont, 10 miles away. Board said, I came all the way from Denmark and I got here before you. <laughs> we can have excuses, but the reality is we have a job to do. I think my favorite phrase in that 
Evangelism is nothing more than one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. We've been given the bread of life. Why would I not tell another beggar where to find that food as well? I read about a sign that was on a pastor's desk that read, I'm just a nobody telling everybody about somebody who can save anybody. That's all of us. That's our tasking. That's our requirement. That's our mission to evangelize.